So right now, we want to encourage you to go online, either in the comments section of our Facebook stream and write your prayer request. Or if it's one of those that's confidential, feel free to message us. But in a real time, with real prayer and real people, we're going to have a real prayer time at the end of our gathering today, and we want to involve you in that. Your prayer requests lifted up before the Father. Let's do this together. Let's engage our Father in prayer together. Today, we are going to continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. I am setting on the historical steps of one of the oldest monuments in Benton County. It has been recognized and been the courthouse since the 1800s. So it has been a, 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 a point of reference for many people uh, across Northwest Arkansas. Why am I sitting here? Because of a statement that's written on a keystone at the top. I had 11th grade government teacher, Mrs. Reagan. And Mrs. Reagan asked everyone in class, what does it say at the top of the Benton County Courthouse? Not a single student knew what it said. And since that day, she told us, and since that day, it has stuck in my mind. This is what it says, if you don't know what it says. Sovereignty rests with the people. Sovereignty rests with the people. Think about that. What does that mean, sovereignty? Sovereignty, power, control, dominance, sovereignty. My question to that statement, does it really? Does sovereignty really rest with the people? I don't know that it does. I think that may be a humanistic statement to say that we are in control, we are large and in charge. Listen, we can't even control a simple virus right now. We are, I don't know that sovereignty rests with us. I want to propose to you today that sovereignty rests with the God of the universe and that we need to lean in and look to the God of the universe. We're in this series, wrapping it up by next Sunday, in this series called The Cross and the Crown. And the crown and the cross, excuse me. And the crown is really what Jesus talks about for the first chapters of the Gospel of Mark. In fact, for 16 different times, in 16 different chapters, over the course of 16 chapters, he talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. That is the crown. But there's also the cross. From chapter 8 forward, he begins to introduce the concept of suffering, the concept of dying, the concept of going to the cross. It really shook the disciples to the core. It didn't make sense to a lot of them. But the cross was a must for the crown to be established. And so whenever you think about sovereignty, does it really rest with the people or does it rest with God? In Mark chapter 8 is the beginning of the conversation around the cross. We're going to look at five chapters today in rapid fire, chapter 11 to chapter 15. When you look at chapter 11 to chapter 15, you see the last week of the life of Christ. He goes into Jerusalem and they're yelling, Hail Him! Hail Him! King of the Jews! And by Friday, they're yelling, Nail Him! Nail Him! They want Him dead and gone. What happened in the course of that week? We're going to look at it because basically it went through the court of public opinion. As I said on the steps of the courthouse, I think about the court of public opinion. What do people think about Jesus? Who is Jesus today? We're going to look in the fi rapid fire fashion in five chapters. We're going to see public opinion number one, the religious leaders. Public opinion number two, the common people that walked and talked with Jesus. Public opinion number three, the Roman rulership. What did they think of Jesus? So let's go into the courthouse and let's begin this study. Courtrooms are where truth comes out Truth is revealed. Truth is uncovered sometimes. It's in a courtroom like this that you raise your right hand in our modern day courtrooms and you repeat after me or you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Truth is supposed to be established in this room. Well, in the last week of Christ, in the court of public opinion, I don't know that truth was sought. I don't know that truth was discovered. But I want us to see in the last week of Christ, as we mark it this week, the last week of Christ's ministry upon the earth, leading up to Easter, I want us to mark the court of public opinion that Jesus had to endure. Again, we're going to look, first of all, at the court of public opinion through the eyes of the religious elite. And I think that they had one primary question on their mind. Who's your boss? Who, who sent you? 
Who gives you this authority? And it happens again and again. I'm not going to have time to read all the scriptures. I'm going to encourage you to do that, to take your journal Bible out and to, and to read along or to note these. But in chapter 11 and chapter 12, we see back to back to back to back religious leaders questioning Jesus, probing Jesus, looking for the truth at Jesus. First of all, you saw the chief priest and the scribes in chapter 11, 27 to verse 33. The chief priest, who was that? That was the religious leader of the day, typically a Sadducee, one of the most educated, one of the most powerful people of that day. But you also see the scribes coming together. As the scribes come together, they're really questioning whose authority over humanity do you have? You're able to do these miracles. How do you have authority over humanity? Again, who's your boss? They're wanting to know. The, the second group of people are the Pharisees and the Herodians. In chapter 12, verse 13 to verse 17, you can read that for yourself, but you'll see the Pharisees, they were the religious leaders of the spoken law. So they took the Ten Commandments of, G of our Father and they actually added 613 additional rules to help you live out the Ten Commandments of God. They were religious leaders of legalism and they did not like Jesus any more than the chief priest and the scribes did. The Herodians, they were a political party that were in cahoots with the Rome. They believed in Herod. They supported Herod, but they also supported the religious legalist. And so they questioned Jesus and they questioned his authority over all authority. And again, I don't have time to go into reading that. You can read it for yourself. But again, they're wanting to know who's your boss. How did you get this authority? Then the Sadducees come on the scene. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were opposite in just about every category except their hatred of Jesus. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They were really in cahoots with Rome. Rome put them in charge of the temple and they were in charge of everything that happens inside the temple walls. And so just imagine when Jesus walks into Jerusalem, riding on a, excuse me, riding on a colt, rides into Jerusalem. And one of the first things he does is he goes into the temple and he turns over the money changers. He turns over the temple. He was messing with the Sadducees. He was messing with their source of income. He was messing with the way that they liked things done. They questioned Jesus' authority over eternity. Because it says in verse 18 of chapter 12 that the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in the afterlife. So they questioned who's your authority over humanity. The religious leaders questioned who's your authority uh, over all authority. And then they question, who's your authority over eternity? Basically, they did not want Jesus to be the boss. They didn't want Jesus to be the leader. The Sadducees were the autocratics, uh, the aristocrats, the wealthy of the day and age. See, religious elites didn't want Jesus to be the leader because it interrupted their leadership, their self-autonomy. Everyone agreed in the religious right that Jesus was messing up their authority. But see what Jesus comes is he comes to be our authority. Once you and I embrace Jesus as our authority, you can move out with authority. Jesus gives us his authority. Matthew 28, Luke 10 point to that. So actually Jesus gives us his authority as we set under and live our lives under his authority. See, he's called Savior in the scriptures. He's also called Lord in the scriptures. He is our Savior. Yes, he saves us from our sins. In fact, in the Gospels throughout the New Testament, 24 times in 24 verses is Jesus referred to as Savior. Yet in the Gospels, 638 times in 590 verses in the New Testament does it translate the word Lord. Jesus is known as Lord and Savior. Some people want Him to be their Savior, but they don't want Him to be their Lord. 
When I was eight years old, I gave my life to following Jesus. I thought I did anyway. I made Jesus my Savior, or I called Jesus to be my Savior. I asked Jesus to be my Savior. But that was it. That was all I really knew. It was years later on in my life when I realized Jesus wants to be my Savior, but He also wants to be my Lord. So who's your boss? Who's my boss? See, when we want to be our own sovereignty, then we don't want Jesus to be our sovereign Lord. And so that's the first question in public opinion today that we have to ask. But once we embrace Jesus' authority in our life, then we get to live under His authority in our life. The second question that everyone is still asking to this day that Jesus had to face encounter on the last week of His life and ministry on the earth is that of the common people. And that was a question of, what is Jesus worth to you? If you remember a life principle from our study in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus inspires crowds, but He calls disciples. It is a calling to be a disciple of Christ. It is an honor to be a disciple of Christ, but it doesn't mean being a disciple of Christ does not cost us. In fact, it does cost us. In fact, He made it very clear in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. He said, And calling the crowd, calling the crowd, With his disciples, he said this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That was a calling and a commitment and a cost involved there. Jesus, in Mark 14, is where we transition to now. Mark 14, you find where there is an example of a disciple who really belonged in the crowd. But you also see a crowd member who really belonged as a disciple. These two stories are juxtaposed right next to each other. It's a story of a woman from Bethany. We don't even know her name. And then Judas Iscariot. We know his name. His name lives on in infamy. Think about those two stories and how they live side by side. The story goes like this in verse 3 of chapter 14. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon, listen, the leper. Jesus was in the house of a man with leprosy. Do you realize what leprosy was? It was a skin disease that was contagious that took your life. A skin disease that was contagious. And Jesus is in the house of a leper. Listen, let me say, pause in my message here just a moment and just say thank you to our healthcare workers right now who are putting themselves in the line of a contagious, deadly disease for our good, that I want to say to our healthcare workers today that you are living the life of Jesus. And if you know a healthcare worker and you're not praying for them, shame on you. In fact, right now, you ought to put their name in the comments section. You, we ought to pray for them by name. And so you do that, tag them in it, and tell them they're living the life of Jesus and Grace Point Church is praying for them. That's just a part of the message because he's at the house of Simon the leper and there's this unnamed woman from Bethany who comes and gives this tremendous offering to Jesus of an alabaster jar filled with expensive, costly perfumes. And and as she offers up this, it says in verse 3 and 4, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. As an offering, she gives this incredibly expensive gift. It has been estimated that the value of her gift was 300 denarii. Now, what is that? Basically, a denarii was a day's wage. So 300 denarii was 300 days wages, nearly a year. I was in Thessaloniki in the archaeological museum recently, and they actually showed us alabaster jars. And those alabaster jars, they said, were heritage gifts that they would pass down from generations. So not only was it expensive perfume, but it was broken open for our Savior. She was given a costly gift of worship. Right after the story of this unnamed woman from Bethany offering this gift, offering her gift to Jesus, there's the story of Judas. And he's not offering his gift. 
he is taking from Jesus. What is Jesus worth to you? She, that Bethany woman, she offered her gift to Jesus. Judas took from Jesus. There are givers and there are takers in this world. And when you look at Judas, he was a taker. In chapter 14, verse 10 and 11, it says this, And when Judas Iscariot was, was one of the twelve, he went to the chief priest in, in order to betray, betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and they promised to give him money. Literally, they promised to give, it says in Matthew, 30 pieces of silver, valued at... 120 denarii. Here's a woman, unnamed, unknown, giving a gift of 300 denarii. 300 days wages. Here is Judas taken from the scalp of Jesus, 120 denarii. You see the difference in the two, the why they're juxtaposed next to each other? Is worship is giving, not taking. Worship is offering, not insisting. And so many people today, when they come to the topic of Jesus, they say, what's in it for me? When what we need to be saying is, what can I give to my Savior? The woman brought to Jesus what she felt Jesus was worth. Judas took from Jesus what he expected of Jesus. So there's a difference in the positioning here. What is Jesus worth to you? In the public opinion's eye, it's as vast as there are people out there. What is Jesus to you? So the third and final question that we see in these five chapters is who is the audience of my life? Who am I living my life for the applause of? We have looked at the religious leaders asking, who is your authority? Who's your boss? And do we really want Jesus to be our boss? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. He's going to be our Savior. He's going to be our, also our Lord. It's both and. It's not either or. But also, we saw that the common people were asking the question, what is Jesus worth? Is He worth giving myself to and giving all that I have? Giving Him my first and my best? But thirdly, who am I living my life as an audience of one and the audience of applause in my life. We all live for applause. We live for the applause of our parents. We live for the applause of uh, maybe it's our peers and we'll even sacrifice our moral code of conduct just to gain more friends. We live for the applause of our boss, our supervisor, our coach, our teacher. We're all living for the applause of someone. Who are you living for the applause in your life? Is it Jesus? Because whenever you come to the third example, you come to the Roman leader of Pontius Pilate, who was the judge, if you will, sitting maybe not in a bench like this, but sitting at his own bench. And who is the accuser, the chief priest, setting a cross, and who's on the witness stand, giving an account for their life, but Jesus. When you think about this scene in chapter 15, you see in verse 2 through 5, you see where the questioning of Jesus is put out there. And I tell you what, Jesus, remember, He inspires the crowd. He inspired Pontius Pilate. It says in verse 5 that Jesus' words amazed Pilate. But did it change him? Did it, did, it, did it convince him to live for him? No, this is a verse you may skip over, and please don't do that. Whenever you go to verse 15, you find the true north of Pilate's life, the true anchor that he's going to anchor his life off, the real decision that he's going to live his life for, the audience that he's going to live for. This is what it says in verse 15. So Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd. The witnesses He's, he's, he's wanting to satisfy the crowd out there. That's how he made his decision. And that's when he turns Jesus over to be crucified. These same three questions that Jesus was faced in the last week of his ministry on the earth, you and I must ask them of ourselves. Who is your boss? Who has the final say in your life? 
Jesus is Lord of all or He is not Lord at all? Is He your Savior and is He your Lord? What is Jesus worth to you? Are you going to Jesus with empty hands saying, God, give me, I want my fish and chips, I want my miracle, I want that? Or do you go with a full heart ready to give of yourself because Jesus has already given Himself to you? Are you offering your first and your best? What's Jesus worth to you? The third question that Pilate had to answer, we have to answer ourselves. Whose applause are we listening for? Whose applause are we wanting to hear? Who are we living to please? The crowds? Are we living to please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? As we have this prayer time, this is what you must listen to the Spirit of God about right now. And if at any, any point in this time you have questions and you want to talk to somebody in a confidential manner, please message us and we will get back with you. One of our pastors will reach out to you. And we want to walk with you and help you as you journey and you answer these three questions in your own soul today.